For Krima Media's Quality, I'm Sane Damini. Joining me today is constitutional lawyer and political analyst Richard Calland to discuss the book he co-authored with Mabel Sitole, titled The President from Mandela to Ramaphosa, Leadership in the Age of Crisis. So Richard, we do have a few books that are written about uh, our presidents. What makes this one unique? And what inspired uh, this uh, striking yet accurate title? Well, I think there were two or three drivers to this book. The first was uh, that the global predicament that humanity faces, what people are now calling a polycrisis across the world, we say and see part of that crisis being a crisis of leadership, that actually political leaders in many places, many countries across the globe, are really letting their people down, not providing the decisive, bold leadership that such a crisis requires. So that was number one. Number two, there isn't a book which tries to look at the question of leadership through the eyes and lens of the five presidents we've had in South Africa since 94. So it's a comparative study. It looks at the five presidents, compares their strengths and weaknesses, and, and asks the question, who has done the best job in leading South Africa in terms of its various different forms of crisis since 94. And lastly, there was the short-term question of who would emerge in December as the next president of the ANC. And in particular, would Cyril Ramaphosa get a second term as ANC president and therefore a second term as president of the country? So when you speak about Madiba's tenure, he didn't hesitate to be cross-examined in court on the issue that involved the South African Rugby Football Union at the time. That, to me, is evident that he was a great respecter of the law, as you also referred to in the book. Tell us about that. Well, I'm a constitutional lawyer. I believe in the Constitution. I believe that it's uh, it's it's more than a piece of paper. It stood up to Zuma. Um, and it's uh, helped protect the rights of millions of South Africans. Uh, and one of the most important features mm. of it is that, in general, uh, it's respected. And one of the reasons I believe it's respected is because uh, Nelson Mandela, as president, um, walked the talk in terms of the law. He backed the rule of law. When judges, such as in the rugby union case, found against the president and said he'd acted irrationally, he didn't throw his toys out of his Pram, he, he stayed calm and he accepted the judgment of the court. And I think it was a remarkable moment. And in that case, he was cross-examined for several hours that day. He refused to sit down uh, <laughs> and he made a symbolic as well as substantial contribution to saying that the rule of law is absolutely critical to a constitutional democracy. And under his watch, you also reveal in the book that uh, the infamous arms deal could be traced back to the 90s. Are you, in a way, trying to suggest that maybe corruption uh, in the ruling party sadly emerged under Madiba's administration? Well, yes, we are saying that. Uh, and I believe it's true because the arms deal, infamous arms deal that was agreed during the final years of the last century when Mandela was president, uh, happened under his watch. Uh, as we cite the evidence in the book, he did know what was going on. He was present with uh, later President Thabo Mbeki at certain critical meetings, and I believe he turned a blind eye to it. And the reason I think he turned a blind eye to it was because the ANC was benefiting from the arms deal. And therefore, I think he thought, well, we, 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 we're proceeding with these uh, uh, procurements. We need those arms to modernize the military in South Africa. And if the ANC benefits on the side, so be it. And he turned a blind eye to it. I think he he thought it was not so serious. Um, but actually, many of our corruption problems can be traced back to that sort of culture of impunity that began to grow during the arms deal. And of course, President Zuma, Jacob Zuma, is facing charges now, criminal charges mm -hmm. now, that date back all the way to uh, the arms deal at the end of the last century. And now when we look at a former president, Thabo Mbeki, who was a Madiba's deputy, his term, you're calling it in the book, the flawed years. His government instituted uh, the growth, employment and redistribution budget program that was known as GEAR. It was a bit unpopular now with his party, the ANC, as well as the trade unions. Can you briefly highlight why it was that uh, unpopular and tell us why some ANC activists 
have also said it was almost impossible to decouple Mbegi and Madiba. Well, that's right. And, and in answering your question, I have to speak about the 10-year period when, first of all, Mandela was president and uh, Mbeki was his deputy president, but effectively his prime mm -hmm. minister. Uh, and then the first administration of Mbeki. Uh, and that was a, a coupling of, mm -hmm. of Mandela and Mbeki. And, and the key decision they took on economic policy uh, during that time was to move away from the Re Reconstruction Development Programme, the RDP, which was a Keynesian kind of um, tax and spend programme to rebuild the South African nation after the ravages of apartheid, uh, and to replace it with what its critics would call a more neoliberal uh, austerity type approach to economic um, resource management, which was known as GEAR. And gear was very controversial. What, what one can say about it now with hindsight, when one thinks about it in terms of leadership choices, is that it was a strategic shift. And it was a decisive one. Uh, Mbeki did it with utter ruthlessness. Mandela went to the Kasatu and said, we've made this choice. You must live with it. And he stared them down. And, and that kind of, whether it was the right decision or not, the kind of decisiveness and the strategic uh, intent behind it I think we we miss now. And the current leader in particular, Cyril Ramaphosa, lacks that kind of courage, that kind of mm. decisiveness. And although you give uh, um, Beggy credit as an institution builder and a serious-minded thinker, you also say that he drove an ambiguous agenda for the continent while he supervised at the same time the birth of the AU. Can you tell us about that? Well, uh, the title or the subtitle of the Mbeki chapter is of the flawed visionary. Uh, there's no doubt that the African Renaissance vision uh, for mm. the continent of Africa was a very major uh, uh, piece of thinking that Mbeki mm. brought to the continent. Uh, and the ambiguity about it is whether, in fact, beneath the, the romance of the vision of Africa taking responsibility for its own governance, its own economy, its own future, was also about um, serving South African commercial interests, because, of course, uh, part of that vision was about extending markets for South African companies, and companies like Standard Bank and MTN and ShopRite and numerous brands that you see when you, you go around the, the, the cities, the capital cities of the region, of sub-Saharan Africa. Part of that was a product of the African Renaissance. So as always with Mbeki, uh, there was contradictory elements. There was uh, complexity. He was a fascinating leader. Um, and I do think he had strategic intent. Of course, he was flawed. His judgment in relation to HIV AIDS was an extraordinarily uh, painful blind spot in relation to his judgment and his leadership. And we 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 talk about that in the book. And when we look now at uh, the former president, who is also referred to as the caretaker, uh, Khalima Mutlande, his time in office uh, followed Mbegi and Zuma's uh, fallout. And he was able, uh, in a way, to navigate the storm despite uh, many resignations uh, from the cabinet. And some referred to him as a source of stability. Now, it, it got me asking a question if it's the main reason why he's still given like, key positions in the party. Would you agree with that? Yes, I do agree with him. And, and it's partly because he was only in power, only the president for nine months. He was a caretaker. Mm. And, mm. and uh, the, the truth of politics is that the longer you're in power, the more mistakes you make, the more enemies you make. Uh, mm. and, and your reputation is bound to take some kind of a, a, a battery. Uh, Mutlanti's reputation is very good, partly because mm. he was lucky enough in a way to be uh, president for such a short time. He didn't have time to make those mistakes or create those enemies. Um, mm. That's a little unfair to him. I think he was a very <laughs> measured hand on the tiller of government. And I think he did bring stability. It was a very delicate mm -hmm. moment when Mbeki was, sure. was removed really ruthlessly by the Zuma crowd from uh, his uh, position as president nine months before the term. It was, it was an unnecessarily, if you like, unkind act to remove him. And it was very, very um, painful moment for the ANC. Uh, and as in McLenty put it in his interview with us for the book, his job was to bring stability and calm at that very particular moment. He also made some very good appointments during his nine months um, in terms of appointments to the Constitutional Court uh, and elsewhere. And I think he is a man of integrity, uh, of calm reason and of good judgment.
and now moving along to interesting years uh, when we were under the administration of now Jacob Zuma. His term has been met with controversy and he's described as a fighter who doesn't give up easily. And in the book, uh, it got me in, it was a bit interesting to, to read that he's also referred to as a Louis Bonaparte uh, with no relation to his intentions and actions. Why is that? Well, I think the idea is that here is somebody who who was uh, extremely powerful and and very uh, aware of his power and very mm. uh, ruthless and effective in using the power that the presidency gives the individual. But he mm. did so with malign intent in service of hidden interests that were uh, for a long time very much hidden from view. And uh, and I remember interviewing somebody who was had an a formal official position in the presidency who told me mm. we are looking forward to your book because we'd really like to know who it is who really uh, advises the president and who he really listens to and we in our interview with trevor manuel the former finance minister trevor manuel tells an extraordinary uh, story about how he was summoned by zuma to come and see him he came mm. to the presidential guest lodge in pretoria he waited for a couple of hours um, as all sorts of people came and went, none of whom did he recognize, none of whom were members of government in formal positions, nor were they recognized businessmen. It was a sort of medieval court where people came in order to win favors or transact deals with, with Zuma. And when finally Zuma emerged from these mysterious meetings, um, he said to Trevor Manuel, I, I'm too tired. Uh, we go away. We can't discuss the matter of business. So it was almost as if there was a parallel power system alongside the formal one of the constitutional government. And as we now know from the Zondo Commission of Inquiry into State Capture, that did uh, great harm. And Zuma was a corrupt and malign force who threatened South Africa's constitutional democracy. Luckily, the rule of law that you and I referred to earlier uh, stood firm and the court's independence and competence held firm. And as a result, we were able to escape the Zuma years but the impact and the aftermath and the hangover of those years, unfortunately, lies very heavily now. And Ramaphosa's very difficult job is to try and rebuild those institutions that were broken by Zuma and rebuild uh, public trust in government. Mm, now, the question is, how damaging uh, will uh, the ANC's reputation be if Zuma were to be now seen campaigning, especially in, in provinces like Wazulu Natal, where he, he is still popular now? Well, I think the ANC has a, has a real Zuma problem because of his uh, ongoing influence and his mischievousness. Uh, mm. You know, he attacked and his family attacked President Ramaphosa in ways that the ANC has never experienced. Uh, Zuma always talks about his loyalty and fidelity to the ANC, and yet he's very quick to break the great traditions of the ANC. I think he's uh, the number one suspect for the reasons that the ANC's culture and traditions uh, and way of doing things have been broken down. It's now a, a pale shadow of the party it was when it came into government almost 30 years ago. So a huge amount of responsibility lies at Zuma's uh, door. Uh, unfortunately, he's still in some parts of KwaZulu-Natal quite popular, and he's able to rabble rouse, cause instability. I believe he was the trigger for the July 2021 riots that uh, started in um, KwaZulu-Natal after uh, Zuma had been uh, sent to prison for a few days as a result of his refusal to obey the order of the Constitutional Court to give evidence in front of Zonda. And that, 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 that wave of violence and looting was, to some extent, orchestrated by uh, Zuma's people in order to cause instability and to bring down uh, Ramaphosa, because Ramaphosa's reform efforts are a real threat to Zuma because he wants to bring uh, and hold to account uh, the people like Zuma who were responsible for state capture. Mm. And now when we look at our current president, uh, Stepul Entenya, uh, President uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, his leadership has been labeled as being at odds with the resolute and courageous leadership that he demonstrated back in the 80s. Do you think he could be mm. blamed for the mess now our country finds itself in? And was it a wise move for him to push for another term? 
a very good question and a very interesting question. And I don't know the answer yet. It's too soon to say. Um, mm. My impression is that perhaps the job is exhausting him, that it's too much for him, that uh, mm. his own abilities, in a sense, are banging up against a glass ceiling that he's unable to break through, that, the, that such is the immensity of the task required of him, that it's beyond him. We compare him in the book to the great American president, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR, mm. who entered the presidency of the United States in the 30s at a similar moment of peril, instability and crisis mm. as uh, Ramaphosa. So that's why we thought it was an interesting uh, comparison. Uh, Roosevelt raised his game and found ways to lead his nation through and beyond that crisis. Ramaphosa is struggling, I think, to do so, partly because of character, and he has changed from the 80s. Uh, in the 80s, he was brave and decisive. He, now he seems timid and cowardly uh, in the face of very difficult decisions that he must confront. But that's the job of leadership. Why has he changed? Rolf Mayer, his former uh, negotiating partner in the constitutional negotiation process of the, of the 90s, says that it's because as president, you have to balance all sorts of interests, and that's difficult. Whereas when he was negotiating on behalf of unions and then the ANC um, during the 80s and 90s, he was representing a single interest group uh, with a single focus. And that's where uh, he found his, his, his natural metier. That's shifted now. The job is complex, and he ends up almost like the proverbial as it seems to me. He overconsults, he dithers. Uh, and as we're seeing now with the cabinet reshuffle or lack of cabinet reshuffle, when you uh, mm. delay too long, you create a political vacuum and people will jump into that space uh, and cause further uncertainty. Mm. And that undermines the reform process. It undermines business confidence, investor confidence, and therefore it's unhelpful. And lastly now, do you think that the ANC has the capabilities of self-correcting as the country gears up for the 2024 general elections? Well, that's another very important question, Sani. And, and one of the themes of our book is how each of these five South African post-94 presidents have coped with and related to their own party, the ANC, which is such a difficult mm. and complex party that's become more difficult and complex uh, as the years have gone by. It's broken, it's degraded, it's not what it once was. I think it's now an encumbrance on the, mm. on the president uh, and it's a, a liability for the nation. Next year, the electorate will get the, a chance to, to decide whether it should continue to have a majority or whether it should be pushed into a minority. The complex task for um, all of us, I think, is that whilst Ramaphosa is a, a flawed leader or a leader with, with many weaknesses, he remains, I think, the best bet at the moment. He is, of all the available scenarios, him in the presidency is still the best option for South Africa, despite his party. Uh, and that's the, the inherent contradiction of our moment. There was constitutional lawyer and political analyst Richard Calland in conversation with Polity to discuss the book titled The Presidents from Mandela to Ramaphosa Leadership in the Age of Crisis.